following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Thank you for changing the world. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Now, we've been teaching from Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. We quit yesterday with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. And look at this in Hebrews 10, 15. It says, Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he said before, This is the covenant I will make with them. This begins to quote from, I believe it's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. He says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's exactly what I've been saying for this whole series. And this was said in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31, when he prophesied that there is coming a new covenant. I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be like the old covenant because they didn't obey it and they couldn't obey it. And so therefore, I'm going to make a new covenant, an unconditional covenant that once they accept Jesus, once they enter into this covenant, he said here that their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Did you know that that is foreign to most Christians today? Most Christians believe that our sins are forgiven. We aren't going to go to hell. But that, boy, God remembers every one of them, that God is still a little ticked off. He's got a bad attitude. And if you don't do everything right, boy, you know, you're going to suffer for it, that there's going to be some degree of penalty. This is just reemphasizing the same point that was made in verse 10 where it says that you've been uh, sanctified through the one offering of Jesus Christ. In verse 14, if you've been sanctified, you've also been perfected forever. Hebrews 12, 23, it was your spirit that was perfected. Now this is saying because of that, this is exactly what the Old Testament was prophesying, that their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. There is no more remembrance of sin. And this is the point that was started in chapter uh, 10 in the first few verses when it talked about that in the Old Testament offerings, there is a constant reminder of sin. You are always sin conscious, but in the new covenant, we should have no more conscience of sin, Hebrews 10, 2. And here he is saying that it was prophesied in the old covenant that this day was coming. We should have no more sin consciousness. Our sins and iniquities, he is remembering no more. And yet as a whole, the body of Christ today has not entered into this new covenant blessing. We are very sin conscious. We are very covered with shame and unworthiness. You know, a typical saying is that I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. That's really not true. I was an old sinner, but I got saved by grace, and now I am the righteousness of God. God loves me. I have right standing. I have boldness to enter into the very presence of God. Somebody says, oh, now wait a minute. You can't do that. Well, let's keep reading. In verse 18, it says, Now a remembrance of these is there is no more offering for sin. That verse has been twisted and applied to a number of different things, but take it all in context. It's just saying that Jesus paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future. There's nothing left to pay. You're whining, griping, complaining, groveling in the dirt, Feeling unworthy cannot add to anything that Jesus has done. If you try and add anything to what Jesus has done, you actually subtract. You actually defile it. It's perfect the way it is. And if you try and add any of your remorse and any of your things to it, then you defile what Jesus has done. And then in verse 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, Remember the word therefore. When you see it, you're supposed to stop and see what it's there for. This is linking all of these things back together. The things that I've been saying for the last 10 days about one offering perfected you forever. Because of this, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Again, you know, I could, I could take hours here and go back to the Old Testament tabernacle and show you all of the different things in the and the symbolism. He's drawing on that, and he says, having boldness to enter into the holiest. 
To some people, this is just a word that doesn't mean anything, but it's going back to the Old Testament tabernacle that had an outer court that was huge, and there was a brazen altar in it, and then there was a small tent inside of this outer court and it was divided into two parts, the holy place and the holiest, or the holy of holies. And the holy of holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the cherubims were over the Ark of the Covenant. And these cherubims, you know, uh, again, we've got other traditions where we make cherubims little fat, naked babies that go around and do things. But in the Bible, cherubims were warrior angels. God placed cherubims at the east of the garden, east entrance to the Garden of Eden to protect it with a flaming sword that if anybody came, they couldn't enter in and take of the tree of life. And so they're warrior angels. And so these cherubims that were over the mercy seat weren't little fat babies. They were these warrior angels. And if anybody entered into the Holy of Holies uh, without the proper sacrifice, which only one person was allowed to do this, and that was uh, the high priest. And he only could come in one time a year. He just couldn't come in whenever he wanted to. He could only come on one day a year after doing all of these things to prepare. And it was very restrictive. And only after that could he enter in one time. And so that's what the point that he's making. That's the way it was under the old covenant. But now he's saying, having therefore... Brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You know, this, this was blasphemy. Blasphemy to the Old Testament mindset. Nobody could just enter into the holiest. Only the high priest could enter in one time a year, and that was after he had done everything right. And if he wasn't perfect, God had smite him dead, and they pulled him out by a rope around his ankle. Man, there was no such concept of having boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. And you certainly couldn't come whenever you want to. It was so restricted. The way to God was not open under the Old Covenant. And under the religious system with the Old Covenant mindset today, the way unto God isn't open unto most people. And that's the reason that most people don't have a better relationship with God is because they're trying to approach the new covenant God in the old covenant manner, and it just isn't working. You can't put new wine into an old wineskin. You can't put a new patch on an old garment. You got to change everything. And these are some of the changes. We need to recognize that you have been sanctified and perfected forever. Therefore, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Notice this. We enter into God by a new and living way, implying that there is an old and dead way. And the old covenant is called a ministration of death in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3 and verse 7. There's a new way. The very fact that he said a new way make, makes the old way not valid. And yet, brothers and sisters, again, most people, most Christians are trying to approach God under the old covenant mindset that I am a sinner and that even though my sins have been purged to the degree that now by the grace of God I'm not going to hell, I still don't have boldness to enter into the holiest. And every time I sin, it puts me back to square one and I've got to give a new... Uh, atonement, get the uh, sin under the blood, and i got to get it all atoned for, or God's wrath will come against me. Maybe not eternal wrath, but wrath in the sense that He won't answer my prayer, He won't fellowship with me, I can't have joy. That is an old covenant mindset. We have a new and living way, implying that the old way wasn't living. It wasn't life-giving. It was life-taking. You know, I'm going to deal with this in my next segment, and I'm going to contrast the old and the new and show you these things. But under the old covenant, it didn't give life. It ministered death. Again, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, it says administration of death, written and engraven in stones. What do you think that that's talking about? Written and engraven in stones is talking about the Ten Commandments was administration of death, written and engraven in stones. The purpose of the law wasn't to give you life. It wasn't life-giving. It was death-giving. But now we have a new and living way um, 
which he hath consecrated, talking about Jesus, has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. That Old Testament tabernacle had the holy place and the holy of holies, or the holiest place, and they were separated by this veil that could not be rent to. It was so huge and strong. And yet when Jesus died, immediately the veil of the temple was rent to from the top to the bottom. And in heaven itself, in the real temple that all of these earthly things were a picture of, in the heavenly temple, the veil, the separation between the holy place and the holy of holies, the veil was rent, the curtain was thrown back, and now we have direct access into the holy of holies, into the very place where God is. I no longer have to come only after I've done all of the symbolism and after I've done these things. I don't ha just have one day a year I can enter into the very presence of God. Now I can go directly through God to God. I don't have to have a high priest anymore. And, you know, again, I'm not meaning to hurt anybody. I'm not trying to cause problems, but we've got a system that is incorrect according to the Word of God. And even in the Protestant church today, there's some people that have their collar turned around backwards and you have to go through that priest to get them to be able to make an atonement and you have to go through them and confess your sins unto them. And ha they are the go-between. That is unscriptural. I don't have to have a priest. I don't have to have a go-between between me and God. Peter said that we are a kingdom of priests. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And I now have direct access unto the Holy of Holies, not just once a year through a certain person. I personally can go into the Holy of Holies with boldness at any time. And if an angel was to try and stand in between me and say, what makes you worthy to come in here? I could rebuke an angel because I have unlimited free access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that what I'm saying is so counter to what most people believe that many of you are just cringing and saying, oh, it can't be. Tell me then what these verses mean. Let's go back and read this. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Jesus is our high priest. Nobody else has to be my priest. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, and on and on and on all of these verses go. You know, if I had time, I'm going to end this section of my teaching on the war is over today. I've got a five-part teaching. This is the third teaching in that five-part series. So today I'm going to end that, and I just haven't got time to go on. I could literally just keep reading through the book of Hebrews, and in chapter 10 it begins to talk about what would happen if a person who is within this covenant and has been sanctified and perfected forever, and it says that there is, only, there is now no more offering for sin. Jesus only died once for sin. What would happen if a person was to totally renounce that covenant? Now, before I go on to the conclusion here, let me just say this. There's confusion on this. Some people think that every time you sin, whether it's big sin, little sin, any sin, you lose your salvation and you have to be born again again. That's not what the scriptures teach. That violates all of the things that we've been reading about eternal redemption. The scripture, I believe, and there's some people that would differ with me on this. I've got some very good friends who believe once saved, always saved. It's impossible to ever get out of God. And you know what? I agree with that to a person who loves God and wants to be saved. I don't believe that any sin that you can commit could cause you to lose your salvation. If you think that it could, well, then what sin is it? And what you have to do is start uh, categorizing sins. Say, well, it's the big sins. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you are guilty of all. So I don't believe 
that there is such thing as an acceptable sin and an unacceptable sin. If you believe that a Christian committing sin causes them to lose their salvation, then any sin would cause them to lose their salvation. And according to Hebrews chapter 6, if that happens, if a person does fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance because Jesus isn't going to make another sacrifice. He isn't going to reapply His blood. If you could do something to violate, to void the blood of Jesus, then it's over. There is no redemption from that. And I believe that. And so, based on that, some people say, therefore, it's impossible to ever be saved and then lost. And you know what? I'm not going to really argue with that because I believe that the instances of people renouncing their salvation are so slim and so seldom that technically I don't believe it's a factor for most people. So if you want to believe that, power to you. I've got some good friends that believe that and we just choose to not agree on this instance. But I believe you can't sin your salvation away. I do believe you can renounce it. And Hebrews chapter 6 puts qualifications on this. There's five things. You have to, first of all, been wooed by the Holy Spirit. You have to be born again. You have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, tasting the good Word of God and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, which I believe is basically just describing a mature Christian. In other words, a baby Christian cannot renounce their salvation. But if you are a mature Christian, which that right there eliminates the vast majority of people, but if you are a mature Christian, I believe you could renounce your salvation. I believe it's very rare. I don't really understand why anybody who has ever matured in the Lord would ever reach a place of renouncing their salvation, but the Scripture warns against it, and so therefore I believe that it's possible. And if you ever renounce your salvation, it's impossible to be renewed unto salvation again. And this is the point that is being made as we continue on here in Hebrews chapter 10. And it uses the terminology. It says, look at Moses, the people that despised Moses' law. They died if they rejected it. It says, how much sore punishment do you think he is uh, worthy of who has done despite unto the spirit of grace and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. And all of these terminology that it's using, it's talking about total rejection. It's not talking about a moment of weakness where you make a mistake and do something wrong or even where you're enticed and you do something but you're repenting over it. This is talking about absolute total rejection. And so what, if you study all of this, what it does, it actually strengthens the point that I've been making. That there is only one sacrifice for your sins for all time forever. And if, even though it would be very rare, it could only be committed by a mature Christian, it is not the same thing as a person just slipping, failing, falling short in some area. But if a person was to totally renounce their salvation, Hebrews chapter 10 makes it absolutely clear. Hebrews chapter 6 verifies it that there is no such thing as being born again again. You just get born again. And for 99.9% .9 of all people, I believe that that's the way that it is. And even though we fall short, all of our sins, past, present, and future, were already paid for. But there is a possibility of a mature Christian renouncing their salvation, and if they do that, there is no more offering. This, what it does, it shows the finality of the one sacrifice of Jesus. This whole concept that is so prevalent in the body of Christ today where we just constantly are in and out of the grace and the fellowship with God, and He's turned from us and He's turned His back. And people say, well, who teaches that? Well, most of Christianity. For instance, when they say that the terrorist attacks are God's judgment on this nation, the hurricanes, the tsunamis, this is God's wrath, this is God's punishment. You know what they're doing? They're still imputing sin. They're still saying that God is holding sin against us, that the war is on. The war is still going. It's an ongoing battle. I'm saying the war is over. The Bible says that the war is over. There's peace now from God towards man. He's not mad at us. All of our sins have been paid for. And because of this, we have boldness to enter right into the very holy of holies, and you don't have to be defiled again. 
Your spirit, once it's born again, has been sanctified and perfected forever, and then it's sealed with the Holy Spirit, and the contaminant of sin doesn't penetrate that seal. It never defiles your spirit again. Since God is a spirit, John 4, 24, He looks at you in the spirit. Your relationship with God is based on who you are in the spirit, and in the spirit you are righteous and holy, sanctified and perfected forever. Boy, that is good news. And if you understood that, you would come boldly into the holiest place by a new and living way through the veil, that is the flesh of Jesus. You would obtain a relationship with him that would transform your life and you'd live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. I'm out of time today, but we will continue our teaching on the war is over tomorrow, so please listen in then. And also listen as our announcer gives you this information about how you can get these materials that I have on The War Is Over. Andrew's complete teaching series titled The War Is Over is available on either CD or on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. Each is offered for 16 pounds. Remember to specify the CD or DVD when you order. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net. After choosing English, click on Resources at the top of the page and then MP3 Downloads. If you prefer, the War is Over series is available in book form when you send £8.50. A Spanish version is also available. You can also get this teaching in a companion study guide for £17.50 when you contact the ministry. The third audio teaching in today's series is available for £3 when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this third CD titled Once for All Eternity Free of Charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Effortless Change for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. To write us, use the address on your screen. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. I know that many of you are hearing truths that is just setting you free. And you say, man, this is good, but I need so much more. You know, we have our website, we have a lot of different things, but really the most in-depth way that we have of sharing these truths with you is through our Karis Bible Colleges. We not only have the Bible College here in Colorado Springs, but we have different Bible Colleges spread throughout the world. We have nearly, uh, I think it's 400, close to 400 people that are taking the Bible co College by correspondence course. There's a lot of ways that you can take advantage of this. So. We've got a number on your screen. If you would call that number, you can ask and people will inform you or send you a brochure about our Karis Bible Colleges. When Andrew and Jamie were young, they went to a conference on biblical prosperity. They desperately wanted to get the teaching, but simply could not afford it. Andrew promised God that if he was ever in a position to make his teaching available, he would never deny it to someone for lack of funds. And that's what motivated me really to give, is uh, the fact that he gives his stuff away. Our hearts are just tied with what Andrew's doing, what he's trying to accomplish. The partnership is helping do what I can't do. I know that I'm a part of something so big. And my gifts can help reach the nations and the people. Whoever has ears to hear, they will hear. said that the um, cheekbones were flattened. The nose bone was not visible at all. The pinky fingers on both hands, the third digit the, the, was missing from the pinky. There were calcium deposits in the baby's heart. And she said, um, I've never seen a baby 
um, show this many signs on an ultrasound and not be born without Down syndrome. When the doctor left the room, I stood up and immediately canceled this diagnosis. This was Satan trying to attack what God had as a plan for our family, and I canceled the diagnosis immediately. For more information on this and other stories, visit awmi.net, click on Ministry News, and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. Invest yourself in Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries today. There was a time in my life when we start with, I went to church and that. But after I had my second son, I was getting into teaching in Ireland of sanctification and things like that. And I had a very bad time of that. And I was afraid of God. I was afraid of God. I was afraid to touch the Bible or go to church. I used to always shrink when I went into church for a wedding or a christening. I was so afraid of God. I thought he was really out to get me. But my son had got me, he was in the army at the time, he brought me a beautiful Bible. But I never opened it. I, I never opened it, it was just an ornament like, you know. I felt safe with it. I don't know why, but I felt safe with the Bible. And then whenever I heard Andrew talking like, that sort of opened all the Word of God to me. The first time I heard Andrew, my husband had just died, which is 24 years next month. And somebody had got hold of some of Andrew's chair, so, so tapes, before he came to England and it was how to know God's will for your life. And if we were to tell people that the point of salvation isn't just getting your sins forgiven, but it's having intimacy, that God Almighty loves you. He is so passionate about you that God Almighty wants to spend time with you. He wants to be your best friend. And I started listening, and you couldn't believe what you are hearing, could you? You know, it was amazing. Amazing to know you were healed to know you had a God that loved you, not that, you know, um, not done that was judging you. Some people still think that, that they're under the wrath of God, and he put that all in Jesus, didn't he? He's love, isn't he? And, he? and he just loves us so much. I'm 84 years old now, and as I learned to live by that word, and not just hear it, but to do what the word said, um, it changed my life.